So Lila, thank you so much for being here. Um, so you've worked on some of the you know, biggest, most influential companies in the world, Microsoft, Wikipedia, and Wikimedia. You're now investing at NEA. So over your career, what have you learned about how to build products that are differentiated? Have your water first. <laughs> you know, I think probably the most uh, challenging part is to envision something that nobody else anticipates. The easy part is really to sort of fix what you already have. That's, that's, that's simple, right? You, all you have to do is you just watch what the users are doing, empathize with people who are using your product, and as tried as it sounds, react to that. You know? uh, but what's really difficult is imagining something that does not exist today. And that's where I think uh, the really innovative companies really thrive, right? And a lot of times, you actually don't know what's going to happen. Like, we didn't know with ChatGPT that it's going to take off. It was, that was not launched for that, actually. And uh, we, to our surprise, it just became this phenomenon uh, because people found utility in that. And I think most uh, incredible projects actually end up like that. So with Wikipedia, most people don't know, but Wikipedia didn't start the way that, uh, that it is today. It started as a site for people to, uh, for experts actually, to collaborate and, and, and write articles. But it was moving too slowly, so the founders put a second server right next to it. And the second server was really for everybody to edit articles, and we were, they were thinking about using it as a feeder into the professional Wikipedia. Well, by the end of the first year, there are 20,000 articles on the uh, common server, you know, uh, and there were only like eight, I think, maybe, <laughs> on the professional one. So it just took off like wildfire. And that's what happens with product that's really bring value. So I think the, the biggest innovation, I think, is, is really, and biggest advice, is really watch for that moment when something magical is happening, when people are seeing and using your product in a way that you didn't anticipate, and what originally was you know, a test, maybe, becomes the real thing and just then write it like it's a rocket. Yeah. How do you understand when that moment is here? How do you understand what customers need, whether when you're in the ideation phase or when you're watching what they're doing? It's hard to ignore. It usually happens with consumer products. So there's a difference between consumer products and enterprise products. So if we talk about consumer products, that piece happens usually when the product is already out there in front of the users. That's why I usually tell founders, get your product out there as soon as humanly possible, because you don't know how people are actually going to use it, so, so to say, in the wild. Um, and once they do, watch them really closely and try to understand what really works and what doesn't. And because we now have these incredible tools, you know, if you instrument your product, you will really understand uh, because you can just watch the numbers, right? And you can literally watch how people are using your website, for example, right? So for consumer products, it's that. But for enterprise products, it's a little bit different and a little bit more designed, honestly. Uh, for enterprise products, I actually recommend that you go and you talk to a bunch of uh, potential users, right? You talk to people who might be, uh, might be interested in using your product, you understand what their pain points are. It's even better if you come from the industry and you experience that particular pain point yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some great advice. So you mentioned the example of ChatGPT. So you were at Microsoft, leading at Microsoft before ChatGPT was released. Can you tell us what your involvement was throughout that process from the Microsoft side and was the impact what you thought it would be? Oh yeah, I originally joined Microsoft uh, to lead our AI and, and then reality division. Um, Microsoft actually had a lot of uh, AI in what Microsoft calls Microsoft Research. Uh, and those teams uh, stepped out into the product groups to actually productize and turn that into a product that's sellable to customers. So that was my first job. And then uh, about you know, 18 months into it, I really realized that something big is happening. And I really wanted to be a part of that. So I, I, asked, uh, I asked to be that. And uh, I spent the last four and a half years actually helping transition the Microsoft into this kind of new, what you would call new reality as part of the CTO's office. Uh, that sort of looks after, after the entire company. 
And you know, as you probably know, there were two investments. You know, the first investment was uh, in 2018, 2019. You know, the first the first billion dollars, and then you know that was quite controversial in many ways because people have not did not see it yet, uh, and they were waiting for that mass massive breakthrough. And then once we saw four. Uh, it was really clear that this is something special. And at that point, the job really became is to assist all of the product teams to push it into their into the product group and to be, make it part of their portfolio as quickly as possible. And if you just look at what Microsoft is doing today, AI is really integral to every single product strategy for them. Mm -hmm. And when ChatGPT was released, has the impact, whether inside of Microsoft and on its products or just in the wider world, been what you thought it would be? Wow, we were all surprised. I'll have to tell you. And I think OpenAI guys were surprised as well by how quickly it took off. Right? That originally, you know, uh, the important impetus for that was actually generating, creating data, right? Because so the way um, the way those models are built, they require reinforcement learning from human feedback. Uh, ROHF. And in order to get that, you actually need to monitor how users are using that and then use that to tune the model uh, to make sure that the responses are, are basically what humans are um, expecting or what, what's more useful for, for people. Right? So this is actually, by the way, why these models are so good. It's not just the model itself. It's that reinforcement learning that happens on top of that that makes them really that human-like, right? almost eerily human-like. Um, and that's, that's what was the impetus originally for this. Just nobody anticipated that there was so much more utility from that. And it's literally over the weekend, it was like, oh my gosh, what's happening? <laughs> you know, and, uh, um, and that, that became this, uh, this incredible, incredible, it's, it's the fastest growing um, consumer product in history. Well, wow. amazing. Well, I'm sure that's informed what you're doing now. You're investing at NEA and also, of course, working on AI across the firm. Um, what white space do you see in the market and from your putting your hat on as an investor and what are you seeing too much of? What do you wish there was less of? Oh my gosh, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll answer the second question first because there's just too much what uh, what you call I, I call I call the blast radius of large language models. So people sort of taking the large language model, filling in some of the gaps, uh, and creating a wrapper on top of that. Maybe it's creating documents. Maybe it's creating. Um, uh, it's basically text-oriented input and output. And there's a lot of that. And you can look at basically every single profession, and you see that everywhere, whether it's legal or marketing or like this 20, 30, 40, hundreds of companies in those spaces. So uh, my advice to founders is if you're going after these obvious sort of quote unquote areas, make sure you have something really defensible there, something really, really special that I can't just go and take maybe two or three additional steps with the large language models, but I achieve the same result. What I think is really interesting is if you step back for a second and you sort of look at how AI is going to trans transform the world, everything from media to science, I think the impact is going to be tremendous. So the hardest problems, and we're looking at scientific problems, the things that human brain is just not capable of uh, embedding in one, one, just one human brain is, is really powerful. So for example, humans struggle to understand physics, humans struggle to understand ch chemistry, mathematics, all of that requires incredible, incredible amount of training for an individual human being, and the brain honestly is not big enough to assimilate all the data that is required to distill patterns from it. So what does this mean? This, is, this means that larger systems, larger AI systems, can be incredible at assisting with that. And we saw this. I mean, the Nobel Prize winners this year, right? Um, among them, you know, people who uh, who invented uh, AlphaFold, which is that doing exactly that, and it's just the beginning of what we're seeing. So that those spaces are incredibly, incredibly interesting. It's deep technology, and you can apply it to anything from you know building building rockets to building new materials to uh, to creating new sources of energy. Uh, you know things like actually making fusion work, for example. And then you go more into what's what's actually going to happen communication to human interaction to understanding our own self actually. Uh, and pointing AI at our own bodies and, and our own brains. And this is where we have to be extremely careful because 
on one hand, we can use it for medicine, which, is, which would be spectacular, right? We still really under, have poor understanding of neuroscience, and we need to crack these big, complex problems and diseases that are emerging because we live longer. So whether it's cancer or whether it's Alzheimer's. And I think there's going to be a lot of work there in combination with AI that is going to help with that. But at the same time, we're also extremely programmable as creatures. So if we point AI at ourselves in the same way that as we point social media at ourselves, which is inevitably going to happen because it's generative of uh, you know, revenues, I think we actually run uh, a threat of reprogramming our minds, and especially the minds of the next generation, in a way that's unintentional. So I think we know, for example, that the, by 2026, I think we're going to see internet being majority generated by artificial intelligence. What does that mean? That means that majority of the things that we're going to be reading are going to be built, created by the models, and as a result, teaching us, right? AI is going to be teaching us. So we should be thinking about those consequences and building in that. And then, of course, the last piece is that I think everything that we know in terms of digital technology, the stack, everything from the power source all the way to the interface is going to change. We don't yet exactly know how it's going to change, but it's a very interesting space, and we track on that as well. Yeah, well, lots to follow up on there. I guess on that last point, is there anything that the founders here can do to prepare for that change, or at this point, is, it's kind of anyone's ballgame? Well, I think it's really, uh, you know, the most important part is actually just staying on top of the trends, right? Like, if you, even if you look at what happened in the last what, four months, right? So we went from just, you know, larger and larger models, which we're going to continue to do. That, you know, don't don't uh, make no mistake on that one. But also, you know, to what what we call runtime compute or test time compute, which is allowing the models to think longer. This is a big change in how models operate. If you're not on top of that, you're going to miss out on, on new capabilities, for example. The same thing happens with, with agents. So you know, right after this, we're going to have a conversation with Sana, lab CEO, Joe, about you know, agenic ways of uh, creating applications and how they're going to affect our life and how we're going to man manage potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of agents that are going to interact with us. So that's a big thing. Again, probably last six months emergence of that. So it's very, very important to just read a lot. By the way, use AI to help filter what you're reading for you, for your interest, especially specifically for your domain, and then compress it for you. Yeah. Um, and on your first point about um, kind of the companies that you're seeing too many of out there just kind of doing this you know, initial um, AI grab, when you um, look around that landscape, do you have an estimate for how many of those companies are going to make it? How many you think are not going to make it? Well, I think we're going to see the standard, uh, you know, the standard situation. I mean, as, as you know, you know, majority of companies don't don't make it, but uh, uh, you know, the ones that do become really, really large and, and really successful. And then there's, you know, sort of the big space in between where companies, you know, are successful. They're just not an outlier, right? You don't have what we call the it's it's the power law. Right? But, and I think this generation and this time right now is so incredibly vibrant and, and you know, it's, it's an incredible time to be alive, it's an incredible time to be you know, graduating from college, starting companies, because I think the opportunities are going to be endless. And even though this, you know, every wave goes and ebbs and flows, the, we're at the beginning of, some, of a really massive reinvention of, uh, of what humanity can do. Yeah. And when you talk about you know, a majority of information potentially on the internet being AI generated in the future, you know, obviously coming from your experience at Wikipedia, you spent so much time thinking about free access to information. There's free access to information. There's also free access to accurate information. So as you prepare for that shift, how are you thinking about that? Do you have concerns? I, yes, I absolutely have concerns. I mean, if you look at the generation that's today in high school and college, you know, a lot of them will tell you, I believe nothing of what's out there. So we went from uh, generations that believed everything and trusted everything to generations that trust nothing. Neither of those things are sustainable, right? And at Wikipedia, we really tried to get the, just so that, that to, to ground everybody here, it's the way that Wikipedia works, it's really, you cannot put anything um, that you believe on Wikipedia, or at least you're not supposed to, and usually it will get caught. But what happens is you need to introduce the source, right? And that source needs to be credible. 
Well, the problem is that even credible sources, like major publications, are often wrong. So how do you find the truth? And one of the things that we are talking about today is, you know, how do you ensure that something is at least authentic? Maybe it's, you know, truth is a, is, is, truth is a big word, but how do you ensure that something is a fact? Right? And today, with uh, large models, you can actually generate videos that looks very much like something that you would actually see out there. Uh, so what do you do? And, and most large, large model providers actually encode the, uh, their models so that you can they call watermarking, right? so that you can understand that, that whatever they produced has been uh, you know, produced by generatively. Well, the issue with that is, and then you can potentially iterate on top of that, and there is you know, edits on top of edits on top of edits, so you still you know, don't know where the source came from. I think it's really important, I think we need to flip that upside down and actually have the original source always watermark content. So if you take a video, or if I take a video, if I write an article, that article is watermarked was written by Lila, written by Emma, and I think that is really important. And then if anybody is doing derivative work off of that, even if it gets into the model, you can, at the end of the day, trace the original source. That amount of um, workflow that needs to be integrated is pretty complicated, and not a lot of model providers are actually thinking of it that deeply. Right? They're, they're thinking about the quick, the quick fix of, you know, if it's auto-generated, you know, we watermark it. And I think we really, really need to be thinking about this. And when we talk about regulation and governments sort of plugging in and trying to help, those are the kind of questions that should be asking. Maybe not even providing answers, but at least ensuring that there's a credible primary source behind anything that the model has produced. And yes, it will, you know, there, these models can hallucinate and will hallucinate, but as long as you can click to that primary, through to the primary source, you will see the original content. And I think that is really important. The model, it's not required. A lot of models don't produce that today. I think it's problematic, and I think it's something that we should be addressed. Yeah. How far away are we from that being the standard? I don't think it will be a standard unless we decide it since it's a standard. I don't think any of the model providers will just decide to do this because it's additional, it's a lot of work. Um, we actually created a, a program at some point uh, that was part of Microsoft uh, that to trace data and actually give credit to the original data creator, for example. But it's a lot of plumbing, right? There's a lot of infrastructure work that needs to be laid in place. And unless you know, either you know, the government comes in and says it has to, something like that has to be done, or one of the really large data providers think it's differentiable for them and somehow it's revenue producing, it won't get done. Interesting. So you also have some thoughts on venture capital and kind of see it as a way to shape the future, but what responsibility comes with that? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, uh, people ask me why, why did I do this, and I actually plan sort of to have this as a third leg of my career because I think, I think, of it, I think venture as twofold. One, as a way to give back. I started my first company when I was uh, sort of a kid myself. I, I was part of the venture community as a founder. Uh, I then became a coach and a sort of seed investor myself. Uh, and I think it's such an important uh, cornerstone. Without venture, none of these companies really would exist. Uh, very, very few companies would have existed with, uh, without uh, funding. And with that comes a huge responsibility of how we deploy uh, capital, right? Because the way that the, the companies that get funding ultimately get the advantage and ultimately are able to at least realize their dream and go after and after the big vision that they have. That's why I think as, uh, as investors, we always ask the founder, what is the world that you want to see? What is the world that you want to live in, that you want to build, and how what you're building is going to help create that world? It's a strange question, I know, because you know, most of the time we ask, you know, how are you going to make your next you know, million dollars, and then how are you going to make the billion dollars, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But without that big North Star, without that vision, I think it's really hard for founders to, um, to actually make the steps towards the, towards the future. You know, it's almost uh, fundamental for their strategy. Yeah, interesting. Um, so when you're looking at founders um, who you're investing in or just in the broader landscape, what skills do you think are most important? Who will be most successful in this era of transformation and AI transformation? What skills are the most important? Ah, oh, uh, there's two skills. So most people say you know you have to be very technical, and I think uh, founders of this generation still need to be very technical. But I think with models becoming so as good as they are and better, 
it's going to be less important actually to be a technologist and it's going to be more important to be a really good uh, barometer for where the pain is occurring and understanding the business behind that. So I think we're going to see a lot of founders who are going to be not necessarily big technical founders, but who really understand domains. And I think we're going to see AI addressing separate verticals of everything from you know, compliance, legal, you know, uh, but to manufacturing and, uh, and making ships and you name it. So I think it's going to be more and more important that people, people who do this understand business over time. I think technology is not going to go anywhere. There's always going to be the deep technologists, and those are going to be people who are at the very intersection between re when research becomes productizable. And that, that's a very fine line, and sometimes we miss it, and sometimes we get it just right, like we did with AI, or, you know, especially, especially with open AI. And by the way, even with open AI, we waited, what, eight years to see what we saw. But when that research becomes teeters on the edge of uh, engineering, that is a very important moment. And those engineers slash researchers are going to always you know, have a job, of course. <laughs> interesting. So you have a really interesting solution for this issue of trust and in this new era of information. But obviously, another major challenge is when you look at these models is issues of bias and how those are baked into models. Do you have a solution there for us? You know, uh, I used to joke, people would ask me about Wikipedia and, you know, errors on that and biases, and Wikipedia has plenty of biases, God knows. Uh, and uh, I used to say, Wikipedia is a mirror that reflects the world. Uh, the people who are there, you know, uh, they embed the beliefs and the biases that they have. Uh, AI models are no different. So that's why it's really important that we actually have uh, that end function, that we need to know what we're actually navigating towards. And so the guys at Anthropic, for example, tried to ground the model into the US Constitution. It's, it's too little too abstract, so it's not going to work. But I think understanding very clearly what are our values as humanity is really important to making the model alignment work. And I think we don't agree on that today. Uh, we have cultural differences, and we're a planet of a lot of conflict today. And I think the biggest problem here is that we're just repeating, we're holding the mirror to the, to the humanity that we are, and we need to hold the mirror to the humanity that we want to be. Yeah. You know, when you talk about this grand vision for how AI will reshape not just business, but society, obviously that incorporates so many people who are not the ones in this room attending this conference physicians, when you're talking about medicine, people who work in education, all kinds of other fields. So what relationship do you see uh, manifesting in the future, and how do you bring those experts and professionals in to understand both how their jobs will change and to contribute their expertise to what that change will be? Yeah, so you, I think you're talking about the feedback loop, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in the world where it's, we're not particularly great at that. And I think we're, we need to be, so the next set of tools that we actually need to develop for AI, right now we use this reinforcement feedback, but I think the next set of tools is to really understand what works and what doesn't for people in these different professions as we take AI towards the enterprise. It's happening organically, but there aren't actually really great solutions yet. So we're looking for some of the companies that are specifically looking, and again, we're going to talk about this in the next conversation, uh, to instrument AI. How do you measure? How do you observe? How do you understand if AI is actually giving you the kind of answers that are valuable to you? And how do you steer it uh, and guide it into the areas where you want to teach it something? And I think that's coming. We're going to we actually do this with our own prompts. But we need to be more methodical, and we need to help people, make, make it easier for people. Yeah. Is some of AI right now a bubble? What do you think is going to happen from a business perspective? Any, uh, any, uh, anything that, that happens like this, you know, in terms of new, big, big massive innovation is bubbly in some ways. Right? So you know, if you look at a good analogy is uh, with the internet. Right? When the internet, we just we, we didn't have enough. We didn't have enough. We didn't have enough infrastructure until we did. Right? So we always a little bit overbuild in different areas. Sometimes we're too fast. Sometimes we're too slow. It's the markets are fundamentally not as efficient as we want them to be. So yes, there are going to be areas where we are overextend, and there are going to be areas where we underextend, and we're. No, that's our job is to watch for where those situations are occurring and you know, pull back when, uh, when we think that there is too much 
you know, like probably in the model construction and, and put, lean in where it's too little, which is where uh, end solutions, for example, and add solution in solution space. So, you know, is it a bubble? I wouldn't call it a bubble. I just would call it as a, a normal development of a new technology that is so, so powerful. Well, thank you so much, Lila. It was great to speak with you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Awesome.